Thanks uh, for that awfully nice introduction, and thanks again for, for having me here. Um, the first thing I want to say sort of by way of qualifying is that um, I, um, I probably stand to learn uh, as much, if not more, from you uh, as, as you do from me. So, um, you know, just seeing this space alone, I wish I had had the opportunity to visit here before we started to build our innovation center in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the States, because I think this, this space is absolutely world class. Uh, it's the best I've seen. And uh, so, so I'm, I, I come here with a, a bit of humility and uh, hope we can sort of get to the exchange portion of, of uh, this as quickly as possible, because I, I, a, little bit of a little bit unsure as to, to how much I can really offer you here. Um, the second sort of qualification uh, I would make is that you know I, I know very little uh, about New Zealand and its health system. And so um, I, I don't want to be one of these ugly Americans who sort of comes over and offers you these ideas and proclamations and uh, you know without acknowledging that in fact it, it, it may not be entirely relevant and I may say things that, that aren't uh, totally connected but but what I did want to do is, is just offer that you know in the last uh, decade or so I've had this great opportunity to be a part of several national and international movements to improve health care and to improve public health. The, the first major uh, piece of work that I was involved in was um, something called the 3 by 5 initiative uh, that the World Health Organization ran in the early 2000s and this was an effort to get 3 million people onto antiretroviral treatment by the end of, of 2005, uh, in, in mostly in Africa, but in other countries around the world as well. And I was sort of a, I was the Institute for Healthcare Improvements lead on that work, but I was really kind of a, a relatively junior person in the, in the whole uh, larger operation. And um, it for me was kind of this incredible baptism in, into the, the world of uh, trying to make change happen in, in very, very quickly under very, very urgent circumstances. And in that particular case, um, you know, we, we were looking at what, what looked like kind of a, an unturnable tide um, in the spread of HIV and AIDS and, and our ability to actually start people on treatment. But I think, uh, you know, the, there have been good strides made there, lots and lots of work yet to do. But that was kind of my, my first experience. And um, I came back from that. And as Jonathan said, I, you know, I, I was, a little bit adrift. I didn't really have a healthcare background. I was expecting to sort of move back to publishing or, or consulting, which I had also done. And uh, Don Berwick, who I think some of you have met, who is the, the head of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and now the, um, uh, and then the head of the uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, offered that I could run this thing that he had imagined called the 100,000 Lives Campaign. And the 100,000 Lives Campaign sought to avoid 100,000 unnecessary deaths in U.S. hospitals over a over a uh, 18 month period um, by introducing some pretty basic interventions to reduce infection and reduce medication error and reduce surgical complication and so forth um, and it, it was uh, an incredible experience for me um, kind of a, a I think a starting point for the patient safety movement in the in the U.S. or at least a, a starting point for it happening um, at at scale. It was also a, a, a springboard uh, to other initiatives in other countries, as Jonathan has said. And, and so what, what the experience gave me was an opportunity to observe healthcare systems, not just in, in the developing world or in the States, which had sort of been my life up to that point, but in uh, Wales, in England, in Scotland, uh, in Northern Ireland, in Japan, in Australia, in um, several other countries, South Africa, the list kind of goes on. I, I really uh, think that the, the major thing I drew was um, almost, the, or, 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 or uh, the major thing that happened in the course of the work was that I was almost like competing, uh, completing an anthropological study of health systems around the world and efforts to change around the world as well because you had people in all of these places really trying to do very bold things when it came to transforming patient safety and, and improving the quality of care. Um, and, uh, and then, having done that until about 2010 or so, I rode Don Berwick's coattails again, uh, this time to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services when he became the, the administrator, the leader there, um, and spent the last two and a half years there. Uh, he was there for about 18 months, and then I spent the last year working for the Secretary uh, of, of Health and Human Services, Secretary Sebelius. And, um, and uh, did gr uh, more great learning, mostly domestic, you know, in, in our 
infinite wisdom, you know, the U.S. government is pretty much prohibited from going out and studying other countries and other governments because, you know, what could we possibly stand to learn from the rest of the world? Um, but, uh, but um, you know, I did really get deeply immersed in different regions of the U.S., three states in particular, Oregon, Arkansas, and Massachusetts, which is my home, um, were places that I spent the last year in uh, really studying closely. and, and uh, and then I also began to sort of move outside of healthcare and work in on homelessness uh, and work on corrections. Um, you know, we have uh, obviously a massive, massive sort of self-perpetuating prison system in the states, and um, and uh, so just uh, all by way of saying, I think I've been exposed to large-scale change efforts, to efforts uh, to to really, uh, in some cases, reduce patient harm, in some cases, reduce homelessness, in some cases. Uh, improve health or reduce diabetes or, or chronic disease, whatever it happens to be, um, I've just been, you know, I, I sometimes feel like I've been like Forrest Gump. I've, I've been, you know, there at all of these moments um, and, and uh, able to, to take notes and, and learn as I go. Um, and so what I hope to do just, and I'll take only 15 to 20 minutes to do this and then, it, you know, I'd be happy to have a conversation and hear your ideas and suggestions and, and uh, take your advice. Um, but what I thought I'd do is sort of offer what I've observed uh, in these different settings and these different large-scale change efforts, um, essentially about uh, what it takes to move from an exciting and thrilling vision of the kind that you all have here. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that. I mean, I think what you're trying to build and what you're contemplating is really uh, pretty, pretty exciting and pretty remarkable. But, but moving from that kind of initial momentum and energy, the celebration, the launch, um, to uh, kind of a day-to-day a, a -day way of operating, a day-to-day -day way of being that actually creates the opportunity for large-scale change um, and, and allows you to move from isolated successes to really kind of national proliferation um, and success on the broadest possible scale. And so what I've done, and it's, it's very simple, is I've sort of, um, I, I've just kind of imagined two different types of organizations. This is an oversimplification, but two different types of organizations, two different ways of operating that you typically see um, that, that I think uh, are, are common once you sort of hit this fork in the road. Once you've made that initial launch, um, there, there seems to be two ways that, that organizations, movements, nations, regions, states go. Um, and and I, I do think that there's some, uh, some real commonality here. So this is the, the first way, and I'll just sort of reflect, reflect on this, this briefly. Um, this is, I think, the road more taken, and I would characterize it as kind of a, a very pleasant road to take. Um, and before describing it in, in any detail, I'll say that, you know, um, this is, it's probably no, no secret, this is the, the road that doesn't work. Um, and, and what, <laughs> probably, again, unsurprising, the way people present things, usually they, they finish with the, the good thing. But uh, anyways, um, what you'll notice is that, that this is, it's a pleasant road, and it's, it's, it's not uh, characterized by sort of gross incompetence or mismanagement. So I think that, um, you know, except in the most exceptional cases, what you, what you find in organizations that are struggling to really change and, and struggling to change fast and at a broad scale is not that there's any lack of goodwill, any lack of positive intent, um, any lack of skill. Um, it's, it's that uh, people kind of fall into ruts of behavior, patterns of behavior that don't allow them to change. Uh, and so, um, you know, w what, what I've observed in these organizations that are um, not as successful, but, but very well-meaning, is that typically you have a general kind of solid mission. Um, you walk into the organization, there's no hospital in the U.S. that you can walk into where they won't say, we seek to provide, you know, in, in, in beautiful script written on the wall in the lobby, we seek to provide the best care possible for all of our patients and to be a productive member of our community and improve the health of, of everyone in our area. Well, that's, you know, I mean, I think that's, um, it's nice, um, but, but typically what it does is it's, it sort of glazes over the kind of specificity and the kind of goals that, that you need to see. The, the other thing you, you see, uh, another thing you see is that leadership in these systems is, is typically, I, I would characterize it as well served. So the way the system works is that everyone in it, every, everyone, um, you know, if, let's say this is a state, everyone is trying to meet the governor's agenda um, and, and constantly reporting 
um, and, and effectively saying everything's okay. Uh, we're, we're meeting all of the goals, don't worry, uh, don't get mad at us, don't, we don't want to get in trouble. So the, the, the direction uh, that, that the system works is that everyone is reporting up to the manager and trying to make the manager happy and keep everything okay. Um, there are lots of committee structures. You notice that uh, the default when change is about to happen, when people are trying to do something new, is they build a committee, they build a group, and they meet, um, and they meet frequently. Um, and uh, I'll say more about it, but you know, what they typically seek to do is to build some consensus and to bring everyone around the table and, uh, and have everyone feel good about what they're trying to accomplish. And again, on the face of it, you would say, well, that makes sense and that's what sensible people should do. Uh, but but uh, sometimes that can almost become pathological, that behavior. Uh, and what it does is it distracts attention from the actual change that's trying to be made. You see high levels of activity. So again, it's not that people are lazy. It's not that people aren't trying to do things. In fact, in many cases, you have people who are working very, very hard on very tight time frames to do a lot of things. They're, they're having meetings. They're having events. They're hosting you know, talking heads who, who come in. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to, to, to really get the ball rolling. Um, you know, that's a, another characteristic. There's a heavy reliance in these organizations on teaching. And what I mean by that is that you know, our, our ped pedagogical model um, in most Western societies is that the way you learn things is that someone stands before you and you, know, you teach and, and you tell people how things actually ought to get done. Um, and uh, you know, we know, we, we have countless studies to, to show us that that actually isn't the way that people learn. And, um, and you know, from, from children to adults, that's, that's not the way that we actually uh, become effective in, in learning things. Um, there's a lot of web-based tools and resources uh, that, you know, and I was, I was sharing this earlier, the, the idea that um, uh, people will commonly build a website and the, the building of the website, the launching of the website is kind of viewed as tantamount to making change. Well, we've launched the website and now, as if by magic, change should actually happen and things should spread because we've got this commonly available resource, people will just take it and use it. Um, but, but in fact, again, Lots of data to show us that that doesn't happen, um, and uh, and then you know uh, what you often see is patients and families kind of periodically invited to attend meetings. You know the customer is is invited to be a part of the work. So th these are, is what I would sort of characterize as the the, the common um, characteristics of, of places that are that are trying to do well um, and and actually struggling. Um, and again, I often I'll show this, and I, I, I worry that I make people uncomfortable because the the effectively will say, well, that's kind of what we do. That's who we are. And this, you know, this is, this is I think, true of at least 90% of the hospitals in the US. Um, there's no lack of goodwill. There's no lack of intent. Um, but, but what you see in the places that, that really thrive, uh, where the road less taken is taken, um, and uh, is, is a slightly different set of things. The first thing is you see leadership serving. Um, in a very different way. So the dynamics are, are shifted from, from the staff serving the leadership to the leadership serving the staff. And in one hospital that I visited, a hospital system, which is one of the most successful in the, in the states and, and in the world, really, in a, in a lot of respects, um, what they shared with me is that in a typical meeting, the proportion of update from the staff to their, to their superiors should be 10%. And the proportion of barrier removal of, of leaders sort of saying, these are the things we're going to do to help you, to position you, to get you in a place where you can do your work better and be more effective is about 90%. Um, and it, I tell you, in my experience, you know, you, you could flip those proportions. You know, that's it, when I worked in the, 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 the government here recently, you know, to go to the White House was to prepare for 14 days uh, a presentation of 10 PowerPoint slides that had to be approved by 55 different people in hopes that uh, no one at the White House would get mad. Um, that, that, that's the reality of, of you know, how we were trying to change the United States. Uh, I'm being a little bit flipped, but you know, I, mean, that's, I think those are dynamics that we're all kind of roughly familiar with. Um, you see a very crisp and quantifiable aim, and I know you all have those, and I know from Jerry and, and, and Jonathan, you know, that this is, the, this is the, um, the kind of the culture that they're bringing here, you know, but um, if you don't have that, it, 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 things become vague. 
um, and they kind of dissipate. And, uh, and so uh, being able to count and, and uh, not have a name that's used for punishment, but is used to sort of galvanize, I think is crucially important. Usually what you'll observe is a shared narrative and a great purpose. And, and uh, what pablum, that phrase is just, that's a, that's a meaningless phrase. So to try to, 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 to bring a little more specificity to it, I want to tell you about this book I read. And have you all read this book? Do you know this book? Um, this woman should be giving me some of her royalties because I talk about this book wherever I go. Um, this is a book called The Paradise Built in Hell by Rebecca Solnit. And uh, her, her study is of uh, communities that um, uh, form during major crises. Um, and I was actually thinking about this book a lot in the last week I was down in Christchurch and, and uh, I have to say, stunned by the, the level of uh, devastation there. I, I think you know it, it's one of those, it's in the news front page for two or three days and then you move <coughs> on. But obviously um, I, I was really, really shocked by that. Um, but I was thinking about uh, this book because what she says is that when people are in crises, when they're in wars, where they're in earthquakes, where they're in volcanoes, where they're in uh, the, the most serious situations, um, they, uh, they reflect back on those experiences as the most meaningful, and this is a strange thing to say, but the most joyful experiences uh, of their lives, the most joyful professional experiences of their lives. And she says, why would that be? And it's because... People in a, in a, you know, we just had Hurricane Sandy in, in, in the Northeast, in, in the States. Um, in a situation like that, uh, no one is worried about professional advancement. No one is worried about taking credit. No one is worried about anything else other than that common shared goal, which is we have to help our neighbors and we have to help our community as quickly as we possibly can. And for those of you who are in the medical professions, of course, you've had those experiences. You know, uh, my sister is, a, is an intensivist in, in a hospital in Boston, and she has those days where she and her team are working for 14, 15, 16 hours straight and fighting all sorts of battles and in it together and arms linked. And, you know, and she says she can walk away from those situations and feel totally exhausted but good uh, because she's lost herself in the work. That's kind of the phenomenon that you observe in the organizations that are, that are really, really thriving. It's just this sense that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves, and there's, there's something very, very special uh, about that. Um, there's a bias toward learning, as opposed to that teaching that I talked about before. Uh, and uh, so here, uh, I always share this, this uh, study uh, that Atugo Wande wrote about in, a, in an article uh, in The New Yorker in, in October 2011. He shared, a, it was a five-year study of teacher skill development in 80 schools in the state of California. And uh, what they found is that workshops led to use of new skills in 10% of cases. Uh, demonstrations and personal feedback led to use of new skills in 20% of cases. And then action and active reflection and coaching led to, to use of new skills in better than 90% of cases. This is something I think we all kind of know intuitively at this point, but we, it, it's not borne out in the work. So it's the, this culture of constantly trying and testing new things and being hands-on and going out and, 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 and uh, getting into that mode um, is, is another thing that we observe. Um, it, it related to getting out to the field, you know. The, the campaigns that we ran at IHI, I knew they were, were uh, being somewhat successful when I observed that by that midway point, um, our office was like a ghost town. We had people who were constantly out in the road. We had one month, April of 2007, where we had 28 events happening out in the field, and we had hundreds of visits to hospitals. We were actually getting out and seeing what the problem was and getting our finger, fingernails dirty. You know, that, that I think, is the, uh, the, the culture. Um, this, this next bullet, is, it's, it's a weird thing to say, but um, there's a sort of a concern with attractiveness um, in, in these organizations and movements that are really thriving. And I can only describe this as, um, it's almost like a, a, a middle school phenomenon. Uh, you know, you, you, you want to be popular. You want to be liked. You want people to actually sort of light up and be happy when they see you coming. Um, and so, you know, in a lot of cases, that can lead you to doing things you wouldn't have otherwise expected to do. Um, you know, in, in uh, some of the work that, that we did in, um, in Southern Africa, we learned that uh, people in remote rural settings really just enjoyed the social event that we were creating. And uh, we thought, well, this isn't really kind of mission critical, and you know, how much is this related to expanding access to antiretroviral drugs? But 
you know, what we learned is that that interaction, that, that, that community time was crucial. And so we made uh, additional time for that. Um, and it made people like us and like the thing that we were doing. It's not a baited switch. It's just that you have to realize that you're dealing with people and, and actually trying to um, light them up and, and get them excited about, about the thing that you're doing. So, you know, our, our goal in the campaigns at IHI, our goal in starting our innovation center at, at Medicare and Medicaid was that, you know, we wanted people to feel happy when they saw our logo and saw our brand. We wanted this to feel like their sanctuary and their place to go. And I mean, this place physically is a sanctuary, but the whole experience of it, I think, should feel like that for people. Um, a major thing we observe in, in the, the large-scale change initiatives that have really succeeded is, is what I would call resilient culture. And this is kind of the, the agreement at an organizational level that every day is going to be very, very difficult. Um, if you're in the business of change, it's always going to be very, very hard. And, uh, and yet, we are not going to lose any sleep over the fact that it's hard. We're going to expect to get knocked down every day. We're going to expect to have difficulty. We're going to expect resistance. We're going to expect trouble. And as a, as a, as a cultural group norm, we're going to not let that uh, make us walk away. Um, you know, and so I, I, I visited a, a, a <coughs> hospital where they had the, um, the Japanese proverb, uh, knock down seven times, get up eight. You know, which I love. You know, and 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 that's kind of the spirit of these organizations that really, really thrive. It's about falling down and getting up again, and, and not being surprised that you fall down, uh, because that's just bound to happen all the time. Um, particularly in the large-scale change initiatives I've seen that have really worked, uh, you know, at, at a national level, there's a balance between controlling and unleashing. So it's important to have an agenda and to say these are the things that we want to do, that we think are really crucially important to drive change. <coughs> But uh, equally, it's important to say yes to everyone who comes with any idea who wants to try something that's sort of far out and crazy. We sort of made a rule for ourselves, which is we had to find a way for everybody to come and for everyone to play and to say yes to whatever anyone wants to do. Uh, and I think that's, that's uh, much easier said than done, but, but that, that spirit, I think, is a, is a crucial spirit. Um, you know, I, I believe that there's no problem that we have in the healthcare system which uh, doesn't currently have an outstanding solution. I mean, we, we know that you, you, if you could really get into every ward and every uh, uh, primary care facility in New Zealand, you know, the, the solution to every problem that exists is out there. A lot of it is just about creating an environment that, that is so inviting that anyone who has a good idea feels like they're going to be recognized and they're going to be invited and they're going to come and, and uh, be a part of this. So, so unleashing that and celebrating it um, uh, letting people run with it, I think, is crucial. And then I think finally, you know, having patients and families in the team all the time is crucial too. So the, the places that really succeed, you know, that your Cincinnati Children's Hospitals or your um, uh, health, I, you know, I've seen this in healthcare systems in South Africa. It's, lip service isn't paid to patients and families. They are just simply in the team all the time. And, and I defy you to find more well-informed, thoughtful, uh, um, innovative, people than those who have chronic disease. Because if you are living with a disease every day of your life, you know much, much more about that disease than someone who is, who is treating you for it. You may not understand you know, the, the pathology of it in the same way, but you understand what it means to live with it in a way that no one else can possibly experience. So having that in the room all the time to the point where it makes you uncomfortable, I think is another characteristic of the places that really succeed. And then the final thing I would say, and this is kind of you know, the punchline, um, and the bad news whenever I talk about what really works in driving large-scale change and transformation um, is that most of it is actually just about the the day-to-day -day, um, logistics of, of the work. It's, it's about uh, the, the getting down to the details um, and, and doing the blocking and tackling that it requires to change. This is a, a, a quotation that I love, comes from the U.S. Army. Amateurs discuss strategy, professionals discuss logistics. You know, their, their view is that, you know, proportionally spend five, ten percent time in, in making strategy, but the balance of your time is actually in starting to implement and starting to manage those logistics and carry the work forward. We could have a long conversation about the, the philosophies of, of, uh, of um, 
international uh, intervention. Uh, but but I do think that you know this mm -hmm. this actual um, way of thinking about logistics, this reverence for logistics, actually allows organizations to be very very effective in what they do. Um, so the, the things that I look at when I'm actually looking at an organization or looking at a social change movement is, are, are these things. These are the things you can actually track. How often does the organization test a new idea or test a new practice? Uh, and I think that you know, it, it, some, some places you, know, you might have sort of a new idea or a new program that's rolled out every month or every quarter. But in the places that are really thriving, it's, you know, it's every half day. Um, something new is introduced and something new is tried. You know, it's that, that spirit. And it, it can be anything from we're going to have a new practice to um, uh, triage patients when they come in the door to, uh, you know, we're going to have a new way of meeting together and a new way of running our meetings. But it's, it's just a constant spirit of trying those new things and counting the number of tests, I think, is, is actually crucial. Counting the rate of spread is crucial, too. So oftentimes we have a big goal, a big audacious goal, but we don't actually count the, the rate at which it's spreading. And so actually studying, these are the number of units to which we want to spread a particular intervention, or these are the number of districts or region to which we want to spread a particular intervention, I think is a, is a crucial way of thinking about it. Um, looking at the time from idea to full implementation is, is, is related to that. Nancy Dixon, who's a, a great writer about knowledge management, um, uh, says that um, her, her number one metric of the, the health of a network the, the health of a group of people that are trying to accomplish a shared goal is, um, is the number of questions asked per day. You know, you know the network is alive, you know it's working if people are actually reaching out and getting questions answered uh, by one another. So it's not how many people visit you know, the, the site, it's actually how many people derive value and walk away with answers to their questions. Uh, and then measuring affection and affinity for the organization or network I think is crucial too. So, Again, I often find that people don't think about these as metrics of, of success or metrics of the health of the organization or the movement, and I, I think it can be quite helpful to do so. Um, how does it feel is a question that I often get. So, you know, again, if we're looking at these organizations that really thrive, um, I, I think, uh, you know, a day in the life, the, the, the analogies I would draw would be to um, that emergency management idea, you know, that, that you're constantly... Uh, moving as fast as you can to test and try new things in the belief that the way we gain new knowledge and the way we make progress is not really in contemplation or, or is in contemplation only ha after having tried and tested new things. You know, it's, it's the scientific method sort of taken to a, to a very active extreme. Um, um, and, and so, you know, it's, it, it feels fast. It, 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 there's a lot of action. There's a lot of opportunism. There's a lot of rapid response. It doesn't feel like going to work. My first six months going to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Department of Health and Human Services, I just felt like I was just going to a series of meetings uh, without any sort of handhold on changing anything, without being able to build anything or change anything, as opposed to when we launched our innovation center, uh, feeling like every day we had things we had to get out the door, things we had to produce, new ideas we had to test. Um, you know, that, that I think is, is kind of the idea. So it's, some people have said it's like a newsroom, it's like emergency management. Uh, someone told me recently they, they likened it to, you know, the skybox in a huge game where the, the coaches are above the field and trying to make adjustments and new strategies based on what they see. I think that's kind of the culture or the spirit um, that, that you want to have in place. And, and I, you know, I'll be honest with you, uh, you know, I, it would be strange if you weren't sort of sitting there and saying to yourself, you know, oh, that's all very nice, uh, but, you know, Come on, I mean, how realistic is it to expect an organization to operate in that way? Um, and, and you're right, you know, the, the vast majority of organizations uh, can't or won't operate in that way. It's just, it's just not in the culture, it's not in the fabric. Um, you know, for a lot of us, um, and this has been true for me at, at certain points in my career, what you're doing, you know, it may not be your vocation, it may not be what you love to do, it may be a, you know, a paycheck. Um, and that, that may be true for, for many of your colleagues. So. Um, it, you know, to, to get to this state, it's, it's no small feat. It's not something that happens as if by magic. It actually, I think, requires very intentional leadership, uh, very intentional decisions about how we operate and what we reward and, and what we recognize. And, and um, you know, but, but it is within reach, you know, and, and I have seen these places and the results that they get are, are absolutely outstanding. You know, I'm talking about hospital systems that 
have driven down all-cause harm across the entire hospital system by, uh, you know, 25, 30 percent every year, uh, year on year. You know, so so th there's just a, a, a spirit and a culture there uh, which is able to tolerate that. How do you start on this? Where do you actually begin if you want to create this culture? I think you know a big part of the answer there is go downhill. And um, I am sure that within the health system here, I'm sure that within this organization, there are pockets of incredible innovation, speed, um, people who are willing to test and try new things. And I think uh, that's that's the direction I would take. Those are the those are the, the, the things to celebrate. Um, and you know, the more they're they're put on a pedestal, um, the more they're celebrated. Uh, you know, the more the kind of uh, culture shifts and the attention shifts to operating that way. So I'll stop there. Uh, you know, I've already gone on longer than I hoped to, but uh, what, what I wanted to do was just uh, kind of lob in, and I realize that's all I'm doing here, just kind of lob in a few thoughts and a few ideas based on having observed a lot of change efforts in, in different settings in different countries. Um, you know, all to be sort of taken with a grain of salt, but there may be uh, a gem or two in there that, that is worthwhile to you as you uh, do your really important work here. So I'll finish where I started and just say, um, thank you again for, for having me and allowing me to observe what you're doing here and I'm looking forward to just kind of absorbing everything uh, while I'm here and, um, and I think what you've started is, is outstanding and really looking forward to watching it kind of flourish um, in, in the coming years. So thank you. Okay.